to the Upper Valley's <laughs> to the Upper Valley's Green New Deal Town Hall. My name is Miriam Osofsky, and I raised two boys here in Hanover with my husband Aaron, and I'm also a clinical psychologist in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And I want to thank Heather Stockwell from Rights and Democracy. <laughs> My dear friend Karen Watson Woo. and CATV and videographer Ron and also videographer Bob Farnham and the Black Center for Donating Space and there were so many other people who helped make this happen and let you all know that this was going on and uh, organizing this town hall and being here with all of you moved me from climate anxiety to empowerment and hope. <laughs> so, here are two of the most important reasons that I'm here today. That's my son Sam on the left, he's our special needs guy, and that's my son Daniel, uh, our son Daniel on the right. And I'm here because I love my family. And in October of 2018, we got devastating news. The, inter, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is comprised of, of some of the most uh, important climate scientists in the world, told us that we have only 10 to 12 years to reduce global carbon emissions 50%, or our planet, our home, will be on an irrevocable downward spiral, spiral of climate catastrophe. And can you believe that? 10 to 12 years. And I immediately thought about my sons and I started to panic. And I thought about what their world would look like, what all children's wor world would look like 20 to 30 years from now if we don't pass what uh, my hero Bill McKibben calls uh, the, a timed test. Um, we need, if we don't get it right in the next decade, we fail. There is no makeup. 10 to 12 years is all we have. And I thought about the effects of climate change that we're already seeing, like the bomb cyclone uh, that just hit the Midwest and the unprecedented flooding that Missouri is experiencing right now. Um, then there was, we were, my husband and I were in New York a month ago and uh, on a, an electronic billboard, ironically on the Fox News building, we saw um, a report about a, a, a cyclone in India, um, wire, wildfires that turned Paradise, California into, into a hell, uh, the, the increasing rate of Lyme disease in the Upper Valley, suffering climate refugees from Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras who are on our southern border, desperate because it's so much harder to grow crops in their countries and the increasing intensity and frequency of hurricanes and tornadoes costing billions in property damage and taking lives. And I imagine climate biting more and more into our gross national product, leaving less and less money for social services that we all need, and especially uh, services for people, vulnerable people like, like our son Sam over there. And I imagine escalating civil uh, unrest with increasing competition for food and water and ultimately a breakdown of social institutions. But here's the good news. That's not the good news. That's the good news. <laughs> uh, the good news, the anti antidote to climate anxiety is climate activism and the promise of the Green New Deal. In November 2018, one month after the Intergovernmental Panel's grim report, in front of Nancy Pelosi's offices in the Capitol, then Representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez joined protesters from the Youth Sunrise Movement who were demanding a Green New Deal. And this was norm-busting. A soon-to-be member of Congress was not only fully acknowledging the severity of the climate crisis, but she was protesting with youth against the federal government's climate inaction and validating the right of young people to advocate for their survival. This photo of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Sunrise went viral. And that helped catapult the Green New Deal 
into American consciousness so successfully that support for the Green New Deal is central to the platform of many of the Democratic candidates for president. So what is the Green New Deal? We'll talk about that in detail, but in sum, it's the beginning outlines of a plan for a massive transition of our energy, transportation, agricultural economies to meet that 10 to 12 year mother of all deadlines. And it's a transition that is so massive and so rapid that it must be funded and guided by the federal government. And the Green New Deal is about making a shift to a green economy in a way that is economically and socially just, respecting the needs and rights of the middle class, but also of the poor, people of color, the aging, women, minorities, people with disabilities like my son, the groups most immediately vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So the plan for tonight is, tonight we're going to answer these questions. Since this is a harrowing emergency, the biggest one humanity has ever faced, why aren't we all talking about it? Why aren't we working on it every day? And why is our government making the problem much, much worse instead of mobilizing to stop it? And the answer you'll see is that for at least two decades, the fossil fuel industry uh, it, uh, has been, fossil fuel billionaires have been blocking climate action and our salvation in order to protect their monumental profits. There's our agenda. And then we'll look more deeply at the Green New Deal, and most importantly, we'll learn what we can do to bring climate champions into Congress and the White House in 2020, so we can get the Green New Deal passed and quickly get to the mammoth work involved in preserving the habitability of our planet. When my presentation is done in about 30 minutes, we will hear from <coughs> speakers in our community. They're listed on your agenda. Richard Abel is here. He's um, a, a de our Democratic rep representative to the New Hampshire House, right? Yeah. To the New Hampshire House. And, um, and then, and then his, his wife, Roberta Berner, who's from the New Hampshire Council for the Aging. And she's going to speak on the Green New Deal and care for, for the aging. And Heather Stockwell is going to talk about the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. And New Hampshire Senator Jean Shaheen has graciously sent us on her behalf Peter Clark, a representative for Projects and Policy, to share a letter she wrote for all of us. And then uh, one of my favorite people in the world, Bill McKibben, um, he made a video just for us to talk about the economics of climate change versus the economics of, of climate catastrophe versus the economics of the Green New Deal. Um, and we have Virginia Snyder here, um, and she, is, she led uh, Windsor High School school walkout in March, was, was part of an international school walkout um, to protest climate in, inaction that was inspired by another hero, 16-year-old Greta Thunberg, uh, who's been skipping school on Fridays to protest climate inaction since uh, she was 15 years old. And we're, we've also got Jackson Brennan here from the New Hampshire Youth Movement. So, and we'll hear from Jackson as well. <laughs> and we'll stop at the end of my presentation for a really brief question and answer, but then we'll jump into the panel and have a long question and answer after we hear from all the members of the panel. So. So why haven't we all been banding together, giving it all we've got to save our planet? Well, the fossil fuel industry has been brainwashing all of us here in the United States since 1997, using their billions to fund climate denialism and buy politicians so that our government, to a large extent, now represents their interests and their profits instead of our common good. So let's take the example of, X, oops, of Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil is one of 25 companies that since 1988 has been producing 50% of global <coughs> greenhouse emissions. That means they have a lot of blood on their hands. They knew, they denied, and they deflected. They knew, in 1978, Exxon Mobil knew about the climate crisis. And in their internal documents, they said man has a window, this is 1978, they said man has a window 
of five to 10 years before we have to discuss changes in energy strategies. But by 1997, they took a turnaround, they changed their tune, and they adopted an aggressive strategy of funding right-wing think tanks to spread climate denialism. They brainwashed Americans, they brainwashed us into believing that there was doubt about climate change, and they induced a false sense of security. Fortunately, we have time to understand the issue better. That's a lie. And by 2005, they acknowledged climate change, but they started to fund climate apathy. <coughs> there will be an endless demand for fossil fuels, and nothing can be done to alter that. And on their side, they continue to fund climate denialism. And we've all taken, every single one of us, me, me certainly included, has taken a bite from ExxonMobil's poison apple of lies. Uh, some of us a little bit more, some of us a little bit less. But we don't want to believe that climate change is as serious as it really is because it's terrifying. So when somebody tells us, oh, things will be okay, we can just go on as, as normal, it's really reassuring. And I know that sometimes I thought, oh, you know, it's okay. They say it's okay. But that's just them hypnotizing us. It's a lie. So we've been hypnotized and we need to snap ourselves out of it. We need to snap our friends and family out of it so we can fight for our survival. This is about survival. So why hasn't our government been mobilizing to prevent climate catastrophe? Well, it's because the fossil fuel industry's second strategy is to buy politicians and they have been extremely successful at that. The Koch brothers, who make their fortune from fossil fuels, united with their, um, with their billionaire friends, and, and they spent $750 million in the 2016 state and federal elections, which is almost as much as the Democratic and Republican parties each spent. And some ex expect that spending to exceed that of either political party in 2020. And this is so entrenched that more and more our federal government serves the, fed serves the fossil fuel industry instead of our common good. Do you know what Secretary of State Pompeo's nickname is? He's called the Congress, the, he's called the Secretary, the, the, the Secretary from Coke. He's Coke's biggest recipient of funds. He isn't ours. He's theirs. And, and, um, and, he, and so his policies benefit his benefactors in, while our planet burns. In fact, the U.S. government is funding the people who are breaking the planet at, at their bidding. Billions of dollars of our taxes subsidize the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> and even Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer have been so steeped in the current political culture that they have limited imaginations about solving the climate crisis. And they're saying those words that will literally kill us. Incremental change, that's a deadly phrase. And a moderate approach to the ener to energy transition, that's another deadly phrase. Uh, because, because incremental change, it's completely irrational. It means irreversible climate catastrophe. There is no makeup test. This is a time test. Um, and, they don't, and, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer don't want the fossil fuel industry to go after them with attack ads or to fund their opponents and that's what the, because that's what the fossil fuel industry does if, if, a, um, if, if, if a politician crosses them. So once uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and Senate, uh, once she was a representative in February 2019 and Senator Markey put forth the Green New Deal, which is a as a joint resolution, 
The fossil fuel industry predictably started a new disinformation campaign calling the Green New Deal an extreme socialist fantasy that would bankrupt the country. Well, what would bankrupt the country is climate catastrophe. And Bill McKibben is going to uh, talk to us by, via a video he made later about that. And there'd be way more money for a transition to a, a green economy if three billionaires, the three richest people in our country, didn't have the same amount of assets <laughs> as the bottom half of Americans combined. Those numbers come from Forbes magazine. That's right, currently the three richest people in our country, <laughs> Three richest billionaires have, have as much money as the bottom half of Americans combined. The Green New Deal would regulate industry like FDR did to get us out of the Great Depression and to help us defeat global fascism in World War II. Modern politicians who've been bought by the fossil fuel industry have deregulated business and created an unfair tax structure. The Green New Deal would, would restore economic justice, making more assets available to serve the common good. So now let's talk more specifically about the Green New Deal. It's the only solution to the climate crisis ever put out by members of our government that actually meets the scale of the crisis. It's the only solution ever proposed that could avert climate catastrophe. I'm going to show you a video of what our country could look like if we all work together and to make the Green New Deal into law. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez co-wrote and narrates this video. And as you watch it, I want you to note the following. There's massive federal involvement, top-down involvement, because the scale of the solution has to match the scale of the crisis, which is huge. <coughs> the Green New Deal will transition our energy, transportation, and agricultural systems in a way that is socially and economically just. And in addition to being top-down, notice that there's a strong bottom-up component in which communities create and experiment with solutions, like local co-ops managing wind and solar energy. These are decentralized technologies that are well-suited to local control. And notice also that above all, the Green New Deal, while not being able to turn back the clock on climate change, can preserve most of what we hold sacred and unlike the status quo and unlike incremental change, the Green New Deal gives us a chance for a relatively happy ending. It's really the only way to have a happy ending. So. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. Ten years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. 
It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people, and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression. World War II, we knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stop being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us.
And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Okay, so, and the microphone is over here. Okay, so let's briefly review. Is this on? Yeah, okay, there we go. Let's briefly review the three core components of the Green New Deal. There's a job guarantee. So, because there's so much to transition that every American who wants a green job can have one, and it's a good job with benefits like health care. And this is much like FDR's New Deal to tackle the, the Great Depression, which had a jobs program, created social security, and protected unions for the first time. Why do we need to offer job benefits? Well, it's because income inequality is now so severe that I know, and I'll bet you know, people who someone in their family got cancer and they almost went bankrupt, or they did go bankrupt, or they were on the verge of homelessness, or they became homeless. Um, and also because there are many promising young people who can't afford college, student debts grew 157% since the Great Recession. Okay, the second component of the Green New Deal is a democratic economy. A Green New Deal must be developed through transparent and inclusive consultation, collaboration, and partnership with frontline and vulnerable communities, labor unions, worker cooperatives, civil society groups, academia, and businesses. Um, so this is, this is uh, about the bottom-up component to the Green New Deal because solar and wind are decentralized technologies suitable for local control and there's a precedent for that in FDR's Rural Electrification Administration, which over the protest of private utilities um, created rural co-ops that to this day supply power to half of the land area in the United States. And the third principle of the Green New Deal is a good life for all, which is an extension of FDR's second Bill of Rights, which said that every American has the right to a job, an adequate wage and decent living, a decent home, medical care, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment, and a good education. So we've tackled seemingly insurmountable odds before, uh, solving the Great Depression with the New Deal, defeating global fascism in World War II, it required that we all pulled together. And when we did, we made the impossible happen. And, but like we did with the, Green, with the Great Depression and World War II, we have to see that we are facing a harrowing emergency. And we have to respond in kind, pooling our resources, regulating industry, so that it serves the common good. So now the best part. How do we win the Green New Deal <coughs> into law? We fill the White House and Congress with climate champions. So here's the plan. <coughs> we build support for the Green New Deal in every corner of the country. We pressure every candidate and elected official to show where they stand on the Green New Deal. We ask them, what's your plan to save collective life on our planet, because that's what, that's what this is really about. That's the truth. And in New Hampshire, we are in an amazing position because presidential candidates are coming to visit us in droves every week. And, we, and what we need, we need to flood those events. And we need to give those candidates the message, if you want to lead this country, you must show us your plan to save, to, to protect life as we know it and to build a better world. So get on the email list of the Upper Valley Democrats because they 
tell us where and when the presidential candidates are coming to meet us. And go early and get a good seat in the front and make eye contact with the candidate and choose the right moment to raise your hand and, and ask a, a question about that candidate's support for the Green New Deal, but preface it with your awareness about that 10 to 12 year deadline. And through the summer and the fall, we need to show up to every presidential debate and make sure that climate is an inescapable conversation on the national level. Have you noticed in previous presidential de debates, how many questions have you heard about the climate crisis in the past? You know? Right, zero to maybe one or two. And, and it's the most serious <laughs> crisis humanity has ever faced. So what, we're, what, what we need to do is, is, in Miami is the first presidential debate. Um, it's June 26th to 27th, and Sunrise Movement is, organized, is, is asking us all to, to organize local debate watch parties. And then, any one of you that can get to Detroit for the second debate, July 30th to 31st, please do. Please make arrangements to do that because we need to be there in numbers, re in, in vast, vast numbers to show that we demand that climate be a central um, issue in the debates. Um, we've got a Sunrise Hub starting in, um, in Dartmouth. You can su support them or join one, or, or support them or start one your, yourself. We've got, um, you can work with 350.org on a national level and also and, right, and on local level rights and democracy. Um, rights and democracy is uh, 350.org, 350 New Hampshire is working to help stop the Granite Bridge Pipeline in New Hampshire, which would put tons of carbon into uh, more into our atmosphere for decades, and what like where did where are we now with with parts per million of carbon in uh, in the atmosphere? Four fifteen, unprecedented, unprecedented, very dangerous. Talk to your friends and family and community and religious organizations about the Green New Deal and ask them to formalize their support at sunrisemovement.org/gnd. And tell your friends and family why incremental change and moderation about climate would literally be the end of the world for us. Um, and then, in 2020, we campaign with everything we've got for candidates who support the Green New Deal. Because this is our last and best chance to save humanity from a future of chaos, pain, and scarcity. So talk to your family or friends, ask them to support the Green New Deal, explain the emergency, undo the fossil fuel industry's brainwashing, and when our loved ones are scared, tell them how much better they'll feel if they take action. So now we're on to our panel of speakers. All right, so first up is Richard Abel. <laughs> who is um, a Democratic representative to the New Hampshire State House. And I'm going to get this stuff out of your way. So, um, okay, so there you go. And I'll get this stuff out of your okay. way. So I've got the microphone. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Um, I took some notes and will bring up some things that I think uh, can be done at this at the at the local and the statewide level because um, because I think that this is the kind of situation where um, absent the federal government and actually international work by many countries um, we c they they really have the most to do and if they don't work on this. There's not, we're, we're too small and too few uh, to be able to accomplish everything that needs to be done on a local or a county or a state level. Nonetheless, there's still a lot of things 
that we can do on a more localized level. And um, I guess if you think about adding to, you know, the whole is more than the sum, sum of its parts, what we can do, say, in state government in both Vermont and New Hampshire, and maybe there's some people here from up from other states, I don't know, but what we can do um, will add up and will be part of what needs to be done um, if we're all, we're all doing it. So I'm going to speak mostly about what I know best from my experience being uh, a state representative in New Hampshire. And um, I'm not exactly w uh, sure where, where to start, but I have taken, taken notes in this, so it may be a little bit scattered because um, I'm trying to respond to what we've already, we've already seen. Um, but I think it'll come, it'll come together. One of the, the thoughts that came to me is that um, there was, well, there was talk about um, big industrialists, particularly in the fossil fuel industry, uh, having a strategy of uh, denying uh, certain scientific findings and so forth. I, I thought one of the things also that I think we're dealing with is that in addition to uh, talking about falsehoods, um, they also, I think, ha have had a strategy of, of discouragement, of trying to discourage people, alienate people from you know, being involved in polit politics. How many people do we know or have we felt ourselves uh, that um, there are times when we say, I just can't stand to watch the news or read the news anymore. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't vote because it's not going to accomplish anything. Um, and we know people uh, who are older, old enough to know better who have never voted and so forth. Um, there, there, there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of ways, I believe, that, that, uh, that, that we're, we're, we're going to have to overcome uh, viewpoints in people's minds that it doesn't make any difference, that why should I worry about this, there's nothing I can do about it, uh, there's no point in voting, there's no point in getting involved. Um, so that, that's, sort, that's sort of a, a general thing. Um, we talked about there being a 10 to 12 year uh, timeline after which maybe it's too late to do anything. I think some of us um, have seen more recent uh, announcements that we may only have five years left. Um, this is very, very scary, very, very scary stuff. Um, so let's see. Um, in terms of, of talk, I'll, I'll talk about the, the New Hampshire State Legislature. Uh, the Vermont State Legislature is very similar in the way it's structured. Um, but think th some things that, that we, we've been trying to do and things that we, we have to do. And um, in terms of my, my colleagues, the 400 of us, who represent you in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, the third largest uh, parliament in, uh, in the English-speaking world. Uh, um, it was, it, if, if one were to design, oh, uh, okay, if one were to design a government that was, that was set up so that you could get as the least amount accomplished. <laughs> what you would do is you would have too many representatives so that it would be really hard for them to get together and do things. And that's, that's what we have, unfortunately. Um, but we do manage to do a lot. And I'll, I'll mention just a couple of, a couple of bills. I, I don't want to go on for too long. Um, that I think illustrate the kinds of things that we're trying to do and, and, and the challenges we have in getting things accomplished. Uh, a couple of bills that you may have heard about that the House 
managed to, to pass um, recently. Uh, they came before my committee, the, the Commerce Committee, uh, in the New Hampshire House, uh, were bills uh, to um, move us away from using um, plastic bags that are not re you know, that are not reusable, one-time plastic bags. Small thing. Um, another uh, that we passed was uh, um, mi <coughs> persuading uh, restaurants not to have plastic straws to use other kinds because of the pollution we're doing um, uh, and its, a, its effect on the oceans and on, the, uh, on, on our ecology. Um, <coughs> There, there. Th 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 these are not these are not earth-shattering, giant steps, um, but they represent what one can do at what we can do at the state level, and we can do that in in, in the in the local level uh, as well. Um, <coughs> you would not believe what some members of of my House committee said in opposition to the idea that they would not be able to get a, a, a straw when they bought a milkshake, as if this was the, like the most important thing, the, mo the biggest crisis that anyone ever, ever faced. Um, we're, we, we, we are, so I guess what I'm trying to say is the people that you elect, that you support and elect, make a big difference and it's not only the it's not only the uh, presidential candidates but your local your local candidates the people that you uh, know and elect um, and, you know really press them on uh, on how on how they feel about things and what they'll vote for so we've 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 uh, in in the New Hampshire house we've dealt with uh, with with uh, pollution, um, dealt with uh, uh, the Reggie program. If you're familiar with that, which has tax credits for um, for reducing pollutant uh, gas you know, uh, emissions and so forth, um, we have lots of things that we're doing. Hi everybody, um, I'm Virginia Snyder, um, like Miriam said. Um, I'm a junior at Windsor High School, um, and back in March, um, I was one of the organizers for um, uh, March, or not March for Our Lives, <laughs> um, Windsor Climate March. Um, so on March 15th, uh, we had students and teachers leave their classrooms and their desks um, to write letters, sign petitions, um, and walk out of school. Uh, we then marched to the post office in Windsor, where we sent off those letters and petitions to our local legislators and our governor. Um, that day, our small school of about 250 kids uh, participated in an event much bigger than just a march. Um, we were part of an international coalition that recognized the urgency of the climate crisis. Windsor middle and high school students joined millions of other kids from around the world to stick our hand up and say, hey, the earth is dying and we all need to do something right now. Uh, unfortunately, though, I think that the reason that Windsor had such a successful march and so we had so many uh, strikers across the world um, is because we're all really scared. Uh, there is very little that is scarier than thinking we really might not have a future. And it's not because of our SAT scores, because they're too low. Um, it's because we've damaged our home beyond viability. The outlook is dire without drastic immediate change. And that's what the Green New Deal is. We are watching our world leaders stand flat-footed while ignoring the reality of the situation. And to make it worse, kids like me or Eliza, um, who also helped me organize the, the, the march back um, a few months ago. Yeah, let's give her an applause before we go on. Yeah. Woo! Um, she was so much help and she's an amazing girl, so. Um, uh, but to make it worse, you know, kids like us, we can't vote, we can't run for office, and we can't make legislation. Um, you know, it's kind of hard not to be super scared when we're, when, you know, when we feel so powerless and at the same time we're seeing our futures be sacrificed so billionaires and politicians uh, don't have to change or lose any money. 
I think that's why we marched and we struck and we wrote letters, because we're so scared at the same time we're frustrated with the lack of action. Man, what kind of world are we living in where children have to ask for a future, for beg for a, for a future? So students banded together in Windsor and around the globe because passivity doesn't really suit our generation well. Uh, I don't think it suits any of us well. I think that's why we're all here tonight. Uh, something I think about a lot is um, why all this work and energy is worth it. Um, it's worth it because without a planet, nothing else I do matters at all. Why get up at 6 a.m. in the morning? Why uh, work hard for a great grade or spend so much money on a college degree? Um, you know, why, why do all this work if the life that we're living and the planet that we're living on isn't sustainable? But the reality is that, um, or it's worth it because, you know, our futures are the, what's worth it. Students are demanding action from our politicians because we are refusing to let all of this work uh, or all of our dreams go down the drain. Uh, we refuse to let our futures slip away from us because it is inconvenient for politicians behind their cushy chairs and behind their desks. So, um, it's far easier to sit back and feel hopeless about this issue because it's so big. It's overbearing. It's, it, you know, it, it's so incredibly large that it, it's really it's hard not to get discouraged. Um, but personally, I, I wanted to organize this march with Eliza because um, I don't want my peers to lose hope about their lives before they've even started. I don't want kids and myself to become passive um, in uh, our lives and let decisions about our planet live, or the planet we live on, left up to people who don't <coughs> seem to care about us. I think sometimes people have to be rallied into action so they can be reminded that they can change things and their voice does matter and students are no different. That's why meetings like this or the march are so important because it reminds everyone of the realities of the situation while also inspiring confidence and hope in our actions. So March 15th was the beginning of kids all over the world turning their fear and anger into action and change. By coming tonight, you guys have joined in the same revolution. We all join a movement that is bigger than the people in this room right now or even the rest of the world's population. This movement represents the future of our planet and the future of people who aren't even on it yet. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, policies like the Green New Deal and the drive of all of you guys um, are, is what has the potential to actually make change in the world. I can't thank you all enough for the work you have done, you're doing now, and you will continue to do. It's saving my future. Hi, I'm Eliza. I helped organize the march. And they said, the UN says by 2030, that is when we have to have had radical change be implanted. For most of you, or especially for me, 2030, I will be 29 years old. My career, my future will not even be started. I will not have the foundations of my life started, or if they have been, it will have just begun. And I mean no offense by this, but for a lot of people in this room, you will have led a full life. The stakes aren't as high for you. And again, I mean no offense. <laughs> we take no offense. <laughs> and I'm here today and I helped organize this march because I want my future. Because I want to live in a world where it's fair and where I don't have to worry about what will happen, about the flooding, the storms, or about what will happen and what the climate will be like in that amount of time. 2030 is the year that we have to fix things. And we only have 10 to 20 years after that before everything becomes catastrophic, and before major cities become flooded, before, um, before storms and fires become so frequent that it makes land uninhabitable, before migrant crises become way worse. We won't just be seeing migration from countries like Syria or Guatemala. We'll be seeing it from places within our own country. California, Texas, Alabama, Florida, anywhere on the coast is subject to flooding that could take out uh, well past Miami. We don't have a choice in action because without it, 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people will die. They will be relocated and our economy will be in shambles. The Green New Deal will cost a lot of money, and I can't deny that. But it will cost more money to deal with that crisis than it will to fix it. Thank you so much, Virginia and Eliza. Your work is so important. And okay, now let's go back to uh, um, the older people. <laughs> let's, 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 let's have Roberta Berner um, from the New Hampshire Council on the, uh, the Aging. You mean the 35 plus? Uh, the, 30, the 35 plus. <laughs> Well, this is so inspiring. Miriam, thank you for pulling this all together. So I, I've worked in elder services for about 20 years, and I'm on the State Council on Aging, which is going to be the State Commission on Aging if the legislature fully passes this and the govern governor approves it, which is good, because that'll take, take it out of just health and human services to be much more, it's everybody's issue. In New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont, the number of aging people is higher proportionately here than anywhere else in the country. And, you know, I've heard since I began working in this field that the mark of a moral and ethical society is how it takes care of its most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The children, the aged, the special needs adults and children. And, you know, how are we doing at that? Um, we've watched um, Katrina, we've watched the elders in New Orleans um, die, come out of their houses held, um, held by first responders, um, thousands of people, Puerto Rico. Uh, it's it's the aging and the most and the most vulnerable people among us who have the most to lose, who lose their lives, who lose their health, who lose their homes, um, in these catastrophes that we're seeing grow in size, grow in impact, grow in severity. So um, the Chicago heat wave of a few years ago, uh, thousands of people who were elderly and poor were affected because it's the poor also who were affected far more than the middle class and the wealthy. Um, incremental change, I, I was thinking about some of the public health efforts that we've been involved in. Um, Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, spearheaded a public health initiative a few years ago called the WARM effort, where Meals on Wheels volunteers were supposed to check on the well-being of the people they were serving. Are they wrapped up in blankets when you go to serve them their meal? Are they complaining about being cold? Is their house indeed cold? Do they have enough money for their fuel? And what were we supposed to do about that? Well, try to get them help, but incremental. And then with, um, with the, heat, it, the heat episodes that we have even here in northern New England, what do we, what do we tell older people? Drink more water? Keep your shades drawn, go to cooling centers, um, check on your neighbor. Uh, and having run some of those cooling centers and see the fire departments bring um, cases of bottled water, I'm thinking, oh boy, this isn't gonna, this isn't a long-term solution. So incremental, I don't know. Um, so it's inspiring to hear the two of you speak. We, you know, we're, most of us in this room are indeed over 35, <laughs> but we have relatives, we have sons. I have a son and daughter. I have a daughter who's afraid of having children. So it affects all of us, even those of us over 35. <laughs> so, um, and income inequality is, is something that I see all the time. Um, we, we've read all the reports about how people 50 and above don't have retirement savings are not prepared for retirement, are working as long as they possibly can. Um, there's not enough of a workforce here to take care of the people who, who need in-home care. Income inequality is real, and the average in-home care person is working for 10 to $12 an hour. Um, and it's, it's kind, of a, kind of criminal. 
So, um, yeah, I think the time has passed for incremental change. Straws and plastic bags, um, you know, <laughs> it's good. But, but I, I like the idea of a holistic approach to, to this and not just passing out bottles of water. We'll go to one more from the 35 plus crowd and then we'll go to the new, uh, to uh, Jackson from the New Hampshire Youth Movement. So first, uh, Heather Stockwell, uh, um, we'll get you set up. So you, she's going to talk about the Green New Deal and Medi Medi Medicare, Medicare for All. And Heather Stockwell is an organizer for Rights and Democracy, which uh, works in New Hampshire and Vermont for progressive causes. Thank you. So I have to hold this. Okay. Uh -huh. I think I can do that and talk at the same time. I'm going to try. Um, greetings, sisters and brothers. My name is Heather Stockwell, and I'm a grassroots organizer for rights and democracy in New Hampshire. I organize mainly around health care, and I work mainly in rural regions of our state. Uh, we're a multi-issue, multi-tactical, member-led organization helping people build power in their own communities on issues which are affecting them directly. Last year, we conducted a survey where myself and others on my team talked to over a thousand residents of the Granite State about which issues of concer uh, concerned them the most. The issue which came in first was healthcare with over 80% of the people answering that they were very concerned about having good quality and affordable healthcare. 90% also replied that a healthcare for all program would be a good solution. I know my own personal healthcare story illustrates that we have a great need for a universal healthcare system but it was also great to hear out in the field from others that they also agreed in our view at RAD, Rights and Democracy, environmental and economic justice is not one with just making a higher minimum wage or adding some more jobs. All of these issues intersect, so we must address them together. One of the things which came out of our survey <clears throat> were that almost, uh, almost the same percentage of people said that they were very concerned about the environment, and specifically around clean air, land, and water. Over 70% were also concerned about good paying jobs and around the same amount concerned about affording the basics like food and shelter. In another section, over 80% of the people replied that they blamed corporate interests, lobbyists, and money in politics as some of the main things for the cause of the situation that they see in our communities, regardless of where they fall, fell on the political spectrum. We are living in a time when we have 30 million people who are uninsured and 40 million people who are underinsured. <clears throat> what that means is that they don't have enough money for their co-payments, deductibles, and premiums so end up doing things like putting off care and letting those health issues become larger than they were to begin with. This number has risen over the last two years by about 7%. The crisis is growing. We are living in a time when people make GoFundMe pages online and put out donation jars on convenience store countertops so that they can get the medical care and treatments that they need. GoFundMe recently released a report that stated one-third of all of the pages made were for medical care. That's 250,000 campaigns totaling an amount of $650 million raised. That's outrageous. We're living in a time when corporations are making the rules and decisions about our health care instead of the people and our institutions of health and experts in the field of health which are supposed to be there to serve us, the people. We're living in a time when the CEOs of these health insurance and pharmaceutical companies are making millions of dollars in their salaries and profits, while hardworking American people are needlessly suffering and even dying because they can't afford those premiums, 
co-payments, and prescriptions. For instance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Daniel Lope, made over 13 million last year. United Health Group, David Wichman, made 17 million last year. And Aetna's Mark Bertolini made $59 million. Pharmaceutical industry is even worse. Bretton Saunders from Allergen is $32 million. Alec Gorksky of Johnson & Johnson, $29 million. And one last one, Kenneth Fraser from Merck made $17 million. Many researchers have linked healthcare-related problems to specific environmental and health outcomes, including global warming, ozone depletion, respiratory disease from air pollutants, cancer from chemical, chemical exposure, and the corporate interests many times prefer to pay a fine than to follow the guidelines in the law. So please, I'd like to take a temperature check in this room right now. How many people have ha either, know, either themselves or know someone who has or have had cancer? Almost everyone in this room, if not everyone. How about asthma? I have asthma. Diabetes. Thyroid disease. I have thyroid disease. Uh, the list goes on. The Affordable Care Act was a giant step in the right direction in our country in terms of health care, and we must continue to protect it until we have a new plan in place. We must begin working towards that new system now, and we need to ensure that every single person in the United States can get the health care that they need and deserve without barriers. Right now, we're hearing a lot of talk about having access to health care. Well, access is great, uh, but if you can't afford to use that care, that's not access. That's a financial barrier in your way to use that care. As many of you may know, this past month, Bernie Sanders introduced the, Senate, the new Senate version of the Medicare for All bill. But what I think is even more exciting is uh, back in February, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Seattle, Washington, uh, launched the Improved Medicare for All Act of 2019 with 107 co-sponsors and the support of many organizations and unions. This is the first time since the bill was originally introduced in, I believe, 2003 that it's had this kind of overhaul done on it. It's now 120 pages long and much more comprehensive than it's ever been before. And basically, it's taking the Medicare system, which already exists, which millions of people already use, and then improving it and expanding the services and offering it to everyone. This new and improved Medicare for All plan will include hearing, vision, dental, recovery care, long-term care for the elderly and people with different abilities. It will have no co-payments at the time of service and there will be no monthly premiums. And we understand that it's not free. There is still much to be worked out on the financial side, but in the, in the richest country in the world, we should certainly be able to figure it out and prioritize our needs. Uh, now I lost my place, I'm scrolling, sorry. Um, so it's not the same Medicare that those over 65 know. They won't need all their supplemental insurance because it will all be covered under this new program. We can't afford to think small when the crisis is so large. Thank you. That's why this is all a big part of our work at Rights and Democracy, and we're working with our members and our chapters all over the state who are hosting barnstorms and canvases and meeting with our elected officials to push them to support it too. We believe that in order to fight big corporate power and money, that we need to build a grassroots, people-powered movement similar to the Sunrise Movement. We will show our elected officials that what that we really do have the political will and support behind us to get this done. So far, about seven out of 24 presidential candidates also support these bills, and we intend to bird dog them, as Miriam uh, said earlier. Uh, 
and find out exactly where they stand on this important issues and others that we care about in the upcoming election. We'll also use it on our elected officials in New Hampshire. So we hope you'll enjoy join us on this campaign and come by our table, say hello, sign the petition and get some more information and get involved. I want to tell you about an event. Uh, speaking of bird dogging, uh, we were re recently on NHPR. Uh, featured uh, it with our workshop, our bird dogging workshop, which is being offered in Claremont next week, uh, Wednesday night, the 29th. Woo! Uh, that's at the at 6 to 8 p.m. at the Center for Recovery Resources, right on the right on the circle. I'd also like to invite everyone to our Medicare for All forum on July 13th at the Manchester Institute of Politics. I have some information on that on the table. We have some great panelists, so. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, now let's go young again. Let's go, to, <laughs> let's go to Jackson Brennan from the New Hampshire Youth Movement. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hey. <laughs> uh, so, as has been mentioned a couple times, my name is Jackson Brennan, and um, uh, I just finished my sophomore um, year at Keene State College. Uh, I live in Gosstown, New Hampshire, and I think that my start to politics. Um, coincided with uh, the election uh, of Donald Trump uh, in 2016. I was a junior in high school and um, I didn't really have an outlet um, to get involved in activism and that changed when um, I got to Keene State College and um, you know at the time I wasn't really you know actively seeking out um, you know, activism, but, you know, I, I, I clearly, you know, felt that, you know, there needed to be change, and um, back then, uh, well, I guess it's just like two years ago, uh, my focus was I was going to be a teacher, and um, I was going to continue um, being a runner at uh, Keene State College, and um, I, I sort of lucked into um, Activism. Uh, my teammate um, on the cross country team, uh, Tris Patchwan, um, decided to start uh, a, a hub of New Hampshire youth movement at at Keene, and uh, he he knew I was into that sort of thing, so he he asked me to join, and I did. And you know, I I didn't really know what to expect. I just wanted to get involved, um, but the the more I got involved and the more I heard um, from, you know, the International Climate Report and um, a lot of the, the uh, you know, natural disasters that have happened, um, I realized that, you know, this was uh, an issue that needed to be, you know, fought on, you know, head on. And, um, you know, with the New Hampshire Youth Movement, um, it, it just felt like the community, um, you know, I felt like I belonged to be there and that I was welcomed and that we had a, you know, a shared vision for the future. And um, so uh, I've decided uh, that I need to focus my time on this and, um, and you know, put, put everything... Um, else uh, aside and um, you know focus on how are we going to have a livable future for everyone and so a lot of the work we do um, is um, bird dogging um, uh, presidential candidates and, uh, and all politicians on issues um, such as uh, the Green New Deal, um, Medicare for All, um, Free College for All. Um, and a, a big one that we focused last semester on was um, voting rights in New Hampshire. Um, yeah. And um, so there was a bill that was signed, um, signed into law uh, by Governor Sununu um, called HB 1264. 
and it basically requires um, out-of-state students to, um, I'm going a little off track here, but I, I just wanted to get like our, our, our core values, um, and then I'll talk about the climate stuff. Um, but it, be, it essentially um, makes out-of-state students um, have to transfer over their car registration and license um, to be able to vote in um, in New Hampshire and that can cost hundreds of dollars and we already know that um, the youngest voting block um, votes um, at you know the smallest um, the smallest amount uh, percentage wise um, and we realize that our values are, are already not being considered and now they're actively you know making it harder for us to be involved. And so we um, started a campaign um, to get um, House Bill 106 passed, which would be a, a repeal of H HB 1264. And you know we were um, canvassing um, and, and tabling on campus um, to get signatures in support of <laughs> petitions uh, in support. Um, we got um, about a dozen um, presidential candidates to um, speak in support of HB 106. Um, so that was that was really big for us. And you know, all this work led up to um, a um, at the state house uh, last month. Um, we had a sit-in. Uh, we brought you know over a hundred young people um, to demand that um, this bill um, be passed. Um, and uh, to make Governor Sununu um, keep his promise because in the past he had said he would never sign a bill that would suppress the student vote um, and then he did so we um, we got you know mobilized for that event and uh, ten of us uh, wrist arrests um, myself included um, and uh, it was it was a really big moment for us, and um, the reason why, other than we think voting is a right for everyone, the reason why we were so big on this and how it, it kind of connects to climate change is that we know that we can't have climate justice if we don't elect um, a climate champion. And we no also know that young people, um, the ones that are affected by this the most um, are the most passionate about this and will elect a climate champion. And so that is one of our biggest things is we are getting young people um, prepared to vote for and informed to vote for a climate champion. The other part is we need our politicians to champion the things that are gonna, you know, give us a livable future. And um, so we've been um, going to events and getting um, politicians to um, sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Um, at, Keene, uh, at Keene State, we have had a bunch of um, presidential candidates stop by. We actually, uh, me and, um, and my friend Tris uh, got Marianne Williamson to sign the pledge. Um, we also, um, earlier, uh, a couple of my co-workers got uh, Elizabeth Warren to sign the pledge. We also um, had Beto O'Rourke, do you want, should I? Oh. Okay, got it. Um, um, to... You're doing great. Okay. Uh, to, um, we asked him to sign the pledge and he didn't. Um, and so, you know, we posted on social media, and um, a, a month later, um, he decided to sign the pledge, and he specifically said, he specifically um, said that young, young activists um, were talking to, this, talking to him about this time and time again, and um, so, you know, the next year we're going to be doing a lot more, and um, the next step is getting... I, I think a dozen candidates have signed the, the No Fossil Fuel Pledge. I, the, the next goal will be to get a dozen um, pa, uh, candidates to sign on to uh, the Green New Deal. Um, yeah. So that's what we're doing. Yeah.
Thank you. Jackson, thank you so much for your activism and you're accomplishing so much for all of us. Um, so Peter Clark, would you have a letter from us for, for, uh, from Senator Jean Shaheen? Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Senator Shaheen couldn't be here in person, but she asked that I read this letter on her behalf. Dear friends, I wish I could be with you at today's town hall in Hanover. Please know that I join you all in spirit as you continue to raise awareness on the need to act now to reverse the causes and effects of climate change. Thank you to event organizers and participants for bringing your thoughts and perspectives to this important conversation. It has been said that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. A few months ago, the US Global Change Research uh, Program released its fourth national climate assessment. This report makes it abundantly clear that every American is impacted by climate change and the threat it poses will worsen over time unless bold action is taken. Climate change is without a doubt the greatest environmental challenge our country has ever faced. Across New Hampshire, Granite Staters are working at the grassroots level to implement thoughtful conservation measures and smart energy policies that also strengthen public health and create economic opportunity. Events like today's town hall will continue this community-wide discussion on smart steps we can take to aggressively combat climate change before it reaches dangerous, irreversible levels. I thank you all for lending your time and talents to such a worthwhile endeavor. Best wishes to you all as you continue your good work. Sincerely, Jean Shaheen, United States Senator. And unfortunately, I have to head out a few minutes before the end, um, so I can't take questions today, but I wanted to give you all our office number in case you'd like to get in touch with our office to talk more about this issue. Um, so it's 603-647-7500. I'll say it one more time, 603-647-7500. Seven five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And please convey our thanks to Senator Shaheen. Thank you. Hi. Okay. My husband's going to help me set up the computer again so we can get our message from Bill McKibben. And then um, uh, that's about six minutes long. And then we can open it up to questions. We can have members of the panel come up here and um, and 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 take your and take your questions. And I'm thank you so so much, all of you, for coming here. And I hope that that we'll all be working together to 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 save our planet. All right. So, hello, everybody. This is Bill McKibben. How I wish I was in Hanover with you. I'm I'm not because I'm off organizing. But look, I'm really glad that the Upper Valley is coming together to talk about the Green New Deal, because I think it's the most important conversation we could be having in this country right now. I love the young people who've put together the Sunrise Movement and launched the Green New Deal. Most of them are veterans of the campus fossil fuel divestment movement. When they got out of school, they wanted to keep going, and they've kept going with something truly important. This is the first legislation that anyone's talked about that's on the same scale as the problem that we face, that doesn't nibble around the edges, but instead goes for the heart of the matter, which is that we need real and dramatic transformation. Um, I know that Miriam has talked or will talk a lot about precisely what is going on um, um, with the Green New Deal, I want to just talk for a few minutes about mm, some of the things that scare people about it all. When people say, oh it's, oh, it's too much or it's too expensive or whatever. And this is clearly, well, it's clearly nonsense. The first thing to be said is economists are always better at adding than subtracting. And no one bothers to point out the almost unbelievable cost of doing nothing about climate change. I remember when Nicholas Stern, Lord Stern, the great British economist, published the first report maybe a decade ago on the price of unrestricted climate change. He said global warming unabated would cost more than the World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression combined. When he came back to that analysis a few years later, 
he said that he'd erred dramatically in underestimating just how expensive this all was going to be. Compared to those kind of prices, the price of going ahead with the rapid decarbonization of our uh, energy systems is small. In fact, it's crucial that we do it because if we don't, if we try and keep bouncing along a little while longer on this fossil fuel uh, scheme, we're inflating the biggest economic bubble uh, that we've ever faced. The stranded assets, the fossil fuels that need to stay, stay in the ground if we have any hope of meeting the commitments we made at places like Paris, uh, it's valued currently at about $28 trillion. Uh, that's far more than the uh, uh, amount of money it took to destabilize the financial system uh, uh, in 2008 with the housing crisis. So it's crucial that we start doing this work now and send a strong, clear signal to investors everywhere what direction we're going in. That's what the Green New Deal would do. And when we do it, it's crucial for people to understand precisely how good it's going to be for all the rest of us. I have solar panels up on my roof. That's how I'm making this um, video for you now. And when I put those solar panels up on my roof, it costs something. I'm glad I had the spare cash to do it. Uh, uh, we need to make that available to everyone, and that's what the Green New Deal envisions. And when we do, what people of all sorts will discover is what I've discovered. What do you know? The sun comes up in the morning and it delivers energy for free. Why do you think Exxon hates renewable energy so much? They hate it because their business model for a century has been you write them a check every month and they pull up a truck and give you some of their fossil fuel. For their point of view, the fact that the sun rises in the morning and gives you free energy is the stupidest business plan ever come up with. But of course, for the rest of us, it's remarkable. It means that a state like mine, Vermont, would save hundreds of millions of dollars. Our energy dollars, to the extent that they're still being spent, would be spent here close to home, not mailed off to the Koch brothers or the Saudi royal family or whoever gets them at the moment. So the possibility for dramatic change is very real. And as that change comes, as we begin, say, to erode the power of the Koch brothers, then because they're our biggest oil and gas barons, then the power to make change in other ways around education, around health care, around all the other things that we badly need in this unequal world, that change will come too. That's why the Green New Deal is so damn exciting. Um, it's not just something we have to do. It's something now that we can do. And as we do it, we will change the world. And let me tell you, it's not just here that people are looking at it. All over the world now, there are Green New Deals popping up and they're energizing people just like this is energizing you. Thank you so much for being a part of it. It's obviously going to be a hard fight against an entrenched enemy, the fossil fuel industry. But it's a fight that with enough enthusiasm and enough solidarity, we have a real shot at winning. We've got to win it because the planet's coming apart. We need to win it because it'll be a much happier world on the other side. Thank you all for what you're doing. So Bill McKibben was going to try to be here. And because he's such a good guy, when he couldn't, he, he made that video for us. But I think that I want to thank you all for coming to this town hall. And let's continue to work together. I mean, we have to work really hard. I mean, even though I work full time and I've got a guy with special needs, I spent hours and hours to pull this together. And we all need to do that because everything that we love is at stake. So let's do it. And yeah. thank you so much for being here.